Brotherhood and Betrayal is an in-depth look at the trials and tribulations of street gang and motorcycle club life. This isn't the run-of-the-mill book that doesn't give the goods. This book will go into detail of events that actually happened. All materials in this book have been approved by those involved. There is nothing poetic, nor is there any price worth paying for the life we choose to live on the streets. James Hollywood Machikari, Brotherhood and Betrayal. How you guys doing? Welcome to the show. We kind of got a special one uh, happening today. Uh, I was thinking about the motorcycle profiling and all that stuff, and there is no better case to explain that how serious it could get as it did in the 1970s, especially in Milwaukee. Uh, we're going to talk about Rocker. He was a member of the Outlaws Motorcycle Club in Milwaukee. And there's a great article that was written by A. Bate of Wisconsin explaining the whole incident, how everything ended up, and the whole nine yards, man. It was a pretty depressing times in the 1970s for bikers in general. Not only clubs, but independents as well. And the history of this lifestyle is something everybody should know that's why when i play this next segment i let it go in in its entirety usually when i'm doing this stuff i'll read uh a little bit of the article give my opinions but this is so serious and so profound that you need to hear it in its entirety, without me giving opinions, none of that stuff. Again, it was written by A. Bate of Wisconsin. And let's go to it right now, and I'll give my thoughts uh, when we get back, okay? Okay. 42 years ago, a biker and friend of A. Bate was murdered in Milwaukee. His death garnered nationwide interest, and several motorcycle publications reported on the sinister circumstances surrounding this dark episode in our history. Roger or Rocker as his club brothers called him, was a decorated Vietnam veteran. Shortly before his death, he joined the Outlaws Milwaukee MC. He lived on the north side of Milwaukee and most of his friends were Abate members. His brother-in-law, Turtle, was Abate's first product director. His roommate was Dave Bruner, later to become a state director of Abate. Because of his club affiliation, he wasn't allowed to join any other organizations, but his heart was with Abate and he attended most of the helmet rallies in Madison as well as signing his name to several petitions Abate circulated in an attempt to gain sponsors for our repeal bills. Milwaukee in the 1970s was not a hospitable place for motorcyclists. The police did not like us, and the only two helmet rallies in the city were near disastrous. In fact, for one rider named Dale Battersby, the second Milwaukee rally was disastrous. He was pulled off his motorcycle, beaten, arrested, and charged with attempting to kill a police officer with his motorcycle. This is the city Lions grew up in and we all rode in. Profiling of bikers was a daily routine. Our huge helmet rally on September 4th was over, and we were basking in the belief that our repeal bill would be voted on in the assembly and we would be free to choose how we rode. Later that month, on September 30th, 1977, Lions joined friends at a north side bar named the Bus Stop Tavern. Events surrounding this incident started at approximately 10 p.m., according to witnesses. There was a brief scuffle around the pool table involving Lions Group and some men who were playing pool. Nothing much of a scuffle, some shoving and name-calling, and then calm. The bartender feared a later escalation and called the police. They showed up 30 minutes later to a quiet atmosphere and asked what the problem was. Those involved in the earlier scuffle were asked to leave, one by one, and according to police, Lyons refused and struck out at them. According to civilian witnesses, he stated he would leave as soon as he finished his drink, 7-Up. He was told no, 
and after several attempts to bring his glass to his mouth, he was taken to the floor and all hell broke loose. He was dragged out of the bar, lifeless, and thrown onto the ground in the parking lot. Initial reports were that he apparently died from a heart attack. This was a futile attempt to cover up what really happened. To show contempt for this lie, we had t-shirts made showing a Gestapo-style officer wielding a nightstick, with the words, warning, this could cause you a heart attack. You can imagine how popular they were, and how police viewed those who wore them. Why did Abate get involved in this event? Besides the fact that Lyons was well known in the Milwaukee Abate circles, he was a fellow biker and our statement of purpose was to fight for the rights of all bikers in Wisconsin. We absolutely felt his constitutional and civil rights were violated. Abate attended the entire medical examiner's inquest into Lyons' death, which convened on November 4, 1977, and ended on November 11. After numerous witnesses testified, both civilian and police, as well as several pathologists who examined his body, the jury foreman read the verdict, the cause of death was the result of brain swelling and concussion due to multiple blunt trauma injuries. The manner of death was the unlawful homicide by reckless conduct caused by a person or persons undetermined. During police testimony, it was suggested that Lyons may have been seriously injured during the brief scuffle, 30 minutes before police arrived. The jury had to deliberate on that theory. Of course, witnesses stated Lyons had no physical signs of injury before police arrived, and he acted normally after the scuffle in which no blows or kicking was noticed. Comparing that to the large group of officers who took him to the floor, dragged him to a dark corner, and surrounded him so no clear view was afforded anyone in the bar, it's not hard to surmise that the serious injuries occurred then and not before police arrived. After being taken to the floor, he never uttered another word on this planet. Witnesses reported seeing nightsticks raining down on lions, but nobody could say who was swinging them or what they were hitting. This was a dance club, and the room was very dark, especially in the corner they dragged lions to. The national attention this case attracted prompted Martin Jack Rosenblum, musician, poet, and curator at the Harley-Davidson Archives, forerunner to the HD Museum, to write a song about lions. Also, Gary L. Kiefner, a history graduate student in the PhD program at the University of Texas at El Paso, based a dissertation on the social and cultural changes of biker life in the 20th century, pointing out that the lion's murder became a sort of symbol for the denigration bikers received from the public. Kiefner was comparing similar motorcycle-related, street-level incidents in other regions of the country for his work, and the Lyons case represented the best documented case of the time. The details of this case were critical to his study and research of the intensity of societal conditions, while exploring the legal, juridical, and emotional dimensions during that decade. In much simpler terms, Abate was seeking justice for a fallen brother. There were many discrepancies during testimony at the inquest that cast a pall over the proceedings. We were met with scorn by many police attending the inquest each day as we worked our way to the front of the hearing room, right behind the family members. The media and others took photographs of us each day upon entering the hearing room, some for the news, others in an attempt to intimidate us. We just smiled and took our seats. Comparing this to current day situations, consider the ramifications if police suspected of brutality were promoted during the investigation. What if one of the principal suspects were put in charge of the investigation? How would you react if you found that those police involved were gathered in a precinct room and compared notes, rehearsed their testimony, and conveniently forgot to bring requested items to the inquest? That's exactly what happened in this case in 1977. The report on the inquest is over 1,500 pages long, and to attempt to explain it would take way too much room in this history. But what is important to note is Lyons was left lying in the back of a patrol wagon for a long time before being transported to the 7th Precinct Station. The official time of death on the autopsy report is listed as 11.38 p.m. We suspect he died much earlier, while still at the bus stop tavern. Police knew he was dead, therefore no rush to transport him, even though one of his companions who was arrested outside, and placed in the wagon before Lyons, was yelling that Lyons was hurt and needed medical attention. Due to tireless efforts by private investigator, Ira B. Robbins, in 1995, 18 years after his death, police officer Robert M. Schmidt came forward to say he was in the 7th Precinct the night Lyons died. Robbins helped break the case and set Lorencia Bembenek free. 
she was accused of murdering her cop husband's former wife. If you want another inside look at the Milwaukee Police Department back in those days, please read her story, Woman on Trial, Copyright 1992, by Lorencia Bembenek, HarperCollins Publishing. Officer Schmidt said he arrived just prior to the scheduled 11 p.m. roll call. At 11.10 p.m. he was told her 97 patrol wagon, which was already in the garage of the station, had a possible dead prisoner and he was asked to remove the man and convey him to the hospital. Schmidt refused because the prisoner should have been transported in the wagon he arrived in, according to protocol. Also, protocol demanded that an injured prisoner be transported immediately for medical attention, yet Lyons was left in the wagon at the bus stop for a prolonged time, then left in the wagon in the garage of the 7th precinct for at least 20 minutes or more. Those involved knew he was dead when he left the tavern, and getting stories straight and creating a timeline was essential in order to protect the guilty. Lyons was finally conveyed to Milwaukee County Hospital, now Fredert, where he was pronounced at 11.38 p.m., but clearly he died much earlier than that. If you can find them, you can read more about the Lyons murder in Easy Riders, February, 1978 number 56, original coverage, Huge Biker Funeral, by Billy Tinney and Woody. You can also read more about it in Biker Magazine, June 1992, number 104, Justice for Lions, 14 years later, by Pan. An important development occurred as a result of the Lions murder. A bait joined a collective of community activists groups who were concerned about police brutality of minorities and rights leaders. During one of the Madison Helmet rallies, attorney Kenner called bikers the new minority. We testified at hearings and rallies and met with community leaders as we helped form the Committee for a Democratic Police. It was through the work of this committee that the term of the police chief of Milwaukee was changed from lifetime status to a fixed term. That was huge. We also received a lot of press after testifying at hearings concerned with police enforcement practices, and abate membership grew dramatically. Roger Lyons was a man, a friend, a brother, and a biker. He did not deserve to die in the dirt and stale beer of a barroom floor. Standing up for Lyons made Abate well-known as a viable force in the rights community. We would later be called upon to once again seek justice for a minority member who died while in police custody, eerily similar to the Lyons case. As Kiefner pointed out in his dissertation, historians up to that time had not really concentrated on the non-commercial cultural history of motorcycling. In contrast, bikers have attracted a great deal of interest among cognate disciplines such as anthropology and sociology. Meanwhile, the Lyons murder remains a cold case file in the dark catacombs of the Milwaukee Police Department. In seeking justice, Abate contacted the FBI, WGN-TV, Chicago, for a segment on the Phil Donahue Show, CBS 60 Minutes, Rep. John Conyers Jr., Committee on Civil Rights, and Sen. Herb Cole, Wisconsin. Abate State Coordinator Tony Sanfilippo, and Free Riders MC President, Dave Zeen, met with then Attorney General Jim Doyle for 45 minutes to discuss the case. His conclusion was nothing could be done without a smoking gun. In other words, one of the cops had to confess or tell on those guilty. Just like what happened in the Daniel Bell case, a 1958 murder of a young black man by police. Years later, one of the two officers in that case came forward to say his partner planted a weapon on Bell in order to justify his shooting of the man as he ran in fear of the police he had committed no crime. The Lyons case was reported in Biker News Magazine, Choppers, Easy Riders, Motor Magazine, Germany, The Bugle, Milwaukee Underground Newspaper, and the Milwaukee Journal and Milwaukee Sentinel Daily Newspapers. Lyons was a personification of everything that is going on today, with regard to profiling and extreme enforcement practices used against bikers. He is relevant because he symbolizes the dangers we face when confronted by a rogue cop, the prejudice of society, and the judgmental pontification of the media. As Marty Rosenblum wrote in his song about Lyons, I just blame everybody. Lyons died on the barroom floor, he died in the street, he died in the paddy wagon, but we will not retreat, from fear and injustice, from secrets held until now. Okay, what did you guys think? Let me know about that in the comments section. It really goes back uh, even further than the 70s with the law enforcement and the hostility that bikers have 
faced with law enforcement. And a lot of people wonder why the older guys have an attitude towards them. Well, it's because of their actions. This country was a lot different back then. It ain't like it is today. The different type of thinking back then was bikers were a ragtag, nothing but uh, scoundrels, if you will. Where today, everybody's cool that's a biker. Even law enforcement. I cannot remember any law enforcement clubs except the Blue Knights. Those are the only ones I can remember going back that way. But now you got thousands of them, it seems, popping up all over the United States. And that's one of the reasons why I have such an attitude with them. And a lot of people can't understand that. So I'm hoping that you stayed with uh, what happened to the rocker or rocker and see how police treated bikers back then. That's something that really does not go away. Not for the older guys, anyway. Now I know there's evolution, and uh, the younger kids don't see it that way. But quite frankly, they weren't even born, and they weren't even around for the bad times. I think that's why in the mid-90s, we all started getting upset with uh, rubs, and that's when uh, the prices of motorcycles went up. But they didn't understand that before they came on the scene it wasn't cool you were actually looked at like a menace to society hardcore that was 1977 and there was a lot of in between until now but we again seen how police were in 2015 with Waco there was a man shot Lying there. All he had to do was get him to a freaking ambulance. But they made him lay there and bleed to death and die. Those cops knew something was happening in that day at Waco and they could have stopped it. But because of the way they look at clubs, they didn't care. Now, are all cops bad is going to be the next one. You know... I believe some are good at heart, man. I believe some want to do uh, good for their communities and stuff. But I'll never, ever sit down and break bread with one. That's just not the way I am. And that comes with the experiences of having to deal with profiling. It was pretty bad in the 90s, but nothing as bad as it was in the 70s and 80s. So when you're hearing people talk about motorcycle profiling, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you actually hear the story that A Beta Wisconsin put out about Roger, it makes you sit back and think, man, we better freaking start giving them old timers, those old gray beards, some respect. Especially the Vietnam vets, which Roger Lyons was one. He was a Vietnam vet. He died at 32 years old. 32 years old. Can you imagine that? And I know there's a lot of other, you know, we got a big uh, criminal thing going with the George Floyd stuff. A lot are feeling, uh, you know, pretty disgusted by that one. Especially uh, blacks. They're really, yeah, they're pissed. And they should be. Because they deal with a lot of profiling, they deal with a lot of poli police brutality. I always said, if you want to know what a motorcycle club member feels like, just look at what the stuff that happens to blacks. Then you'll know. This is not blown out of proportion like uh, a lot in the media will tell you. Because it ain't. It's not blown out of proportion. This actually happens. And back then, they defended the cops pretty freaking heavy, man. Pretty freaking heavy. It was actually was quite freaking uh, disgusting. I'm going to pull up an article right now and give you an example of the kind of reporting 
that they did in 1996. Now, this is almost 20 years after everything went down. But you can still see the style of reporting when we go over it. Chicago Tribune. Yeah, our Chicago Tribune. Slain bikers mourners won't let police off the hook. How disgusting is that title right there? The throaty rumble of more than 100 Harley-Davidson engines filled the air Saturday as a column of bikers from several states made its way out of a gritty industrial neighborhood to Roger Rocker Lion's Grave at Holy Cross Cemetery. Nearby, a dozen, they couldn't even let them have a freaking memorial without the cops be there. A dozen cops were there. They watched, took notes, snapped pictures, and stopped a couple of bikers for questioning. They couldn't even let them be at this. And this was actually 19 years later after it. Now, a lot of clubs have memorial rides. This is one of them. Now, the officers provided a dutiful escort for the procession. <laughs> I wonder if that was arranged, but they were, sna you know what, they wanted to give them an escort, but then they want to snap pictures, take notes, and question everybody. Uh, the tense and bizarre uh, tableau has occurred annually for the last 19 years. Lions, a 32 year old Vietnam veteran, laid off vending machine serviceman and a member of the Milwaukee Outlaws Motorcycle Club died on a rainy night of head injuries while in police custody. That was September 30th, 1977. While in police custody. His friends and the outlaws and the bike riders who never knew him have held the memorial ride ever since. They will not let their, uh, die their belief that he was killed by baton-wielding police officers who have been silent ever since. Quote, The Milwaukee Police Department killed Roger Lyons. That's all there is to it, said Michael Goodman, an outlaw who was with Lyons that night. This belief persists despite a coroner's inquest and a federal grand jury that found no evidence to justify prosecution. They claim all 12 of the officers involved passed polygraph test. Hook them up to the, you know, the modern day polygraph test to see what happens. Seat a new grand jury and see what happens. 1977 was a lot different than it is today. Quote, there has been a wrong done here and we need to right that wrong. This, according to... To a state senator, David Zine of Eau Claire, who was also a Vietnam veteran and a Harley rider who has sought to reopen the case. So even a state senator back in 96 says this case needed to be open. Medical examiners concluded that Lyons died from blunt trauma to the brain. Several uh, indentations were noted on his skull. The inquest jury appointed by the county sheriff ruled the death an unlawful homicide by reckless conduct by a person or persons undetermined. The jurors did not, however, rule out as a possible cause a brief tavern fight Lyons was involved in, in earlier that night. You guys heard it. You heard everything that they put out on that incident. The fight, which took place at a former bus stop tavern on Milwaukee's northwest side, involved Lyons, Goodman, and Harry Ross, known as Horrible Harry, the three all-Vietnam veterans tangled with three men playing pool. And then he talks about the bartender who called the police and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it basically gives somewhat of the argument that was just made. Few at the tavern except Goodman and Andrea Jackson, a go-go dancer, testified they couldn't could get a clear enough view to see if the blows were landing on Lyons' head, but most agreed that Lyons appeared unconscious when he was half carried, half dragged out of the bar. 
So there was people that seen this. Interesting here. In subsequent deaths of blacks in police custody, there was an outrage expressed by Milwaukee's black community, save for the bikers. There was no outrage expressed over his death. That's because most of us uh, don't know how to organize that good. Things were different in an even amidst in here 1977. Vietnam veterans were not well received, which is disgusting. And the outlaws who were members had been criminally prosecuted in several cities were viewed as a menace to society. Yeah. They were in the 70s. You guys think it's bad now? It was bad back then. And that's why you need to respect the traditions and all that kind of stuff. It's because these type of, of people paid for it with their lives. Dan Folger, who was president of the Milwaukee Outlaws in 77, uh, Breyer, who was uh, the chief of police, wanted to shut him down. It was almost like a psychological war between us and them. That made it all easier to enforce the code of silence, said Zine, the state senator who has attended several memorial rides for Lions. I don't know if there's any way of ever finding out the truth unless somebody comes forward. I wish somebody would come forward. I really do. Because this is a case that needs to be reopened and studied again. With today's technology, you might get somewhere. What do you guys think? What did you guys think of how the incident from A Beta Wisconsin's point of view? On all this sounded it kind of gives you a, like a time warp type of deal where you go back in time and you hear it straight from the people that were there and knew about this profiling won't ever go away until you get involved in Illinois right now there's a profiling bill a motorcycle profiling bill up in the house, I believe. If you're in Illinois, you're going to want to make sure that you contact your reps to have them be a co-signer on that bill. If you're getting profiled, make sure you go to the MPP's website, fill out that motorcycle profiling uh, survey. If you're not a member of ABATE, if you're not a member of any biker rights thing, make sure you get involved, man. You really do uh, need to. Uh, but as we're talking about uh, Wisconsin now, uh, good news, A. Bates putting out. Wisconsin congressman introduces legislature ensuring bikers have a voice. That's H.R. 2141, renewing the Motorcycle Advisory Council Reauthorization Act. It's a bipartisan bill that would reauthorize the council for the next six years and would allow more seats at the table for motorcyclists to be represented. A Beta Wisconsin would like to thank Congressman Gallagher for taking the lead on introducing this piece of legislation. We would also like to announce and thank Wisconsin Congresswoman Gwen Moore for signing on as an original co-sponsor. When introducing this bill, Congressman Gallagher said, Few states know motorcycles better than Wisconsin, and this bill ensures we can find ways to allow more growth in the industry and make Wisconsin roads more safer. Good news out of Wisconsin on that front. So, we're going to go into the second segment of the show, MotorcycleMadhouseRadio.com. If you're uh, on Discord, man, just go hop into that Discord room, man. You'll see us over there live. China Dow's here. Uh, those that's not going to come over, and you be that way then. <laughs> you know, I appreciate you coming on. Don't forget to get uh, your copy of uh, Biker. Uh, oh, man, I screwed it up. That thing's got me messed up. That uh, what we just played, Brotherhood and Betrayal. It's on Amazon and all that good stuff. Uh, with that, I'll talk to you guys uh, later on YouTube. 